Welcome back to Bargaining and War. This lecture is on peace premiums, which are a subtle determinant of whether you get peace or war to happen in a game with incomplete information. Let's start off by defining a peace premium, and then we'll picture it and understand why it matters for the decisions of war and peace. So the definition is how much a proposer must overpay one type to induce another type to accept. In practice, what this means, what we're going to be doing in a second, is taking a look at one type's utility for war and subtracting it from another type's utility for war and seeing how big that difference is. But let's go ahead and try to put a picture on this and that visualization will help us understand why the peace premium matters. So let's think about the situation where A is uncertain about its own probability of victory and B is privately informed about that. So in that game with a binary type space with probability Q, we had a situation where A had more power. The probability of victory was P prime. If we just go ahead and draw the costs of war around that, we have our bargaining range. And with probability one minus Q, then we had A not having as much power. So we call that P as the distribution of power. And again, if we just draw the cost around it, then we get our bargaining range. So the only difference between the top case and the bottom case is A is relatively more likely to win in the first case than it is in the second case. And what's more, while A does not know that information, B does. B is privately informed. What we've seen before is that under these circumstances, there are only two possible optimal offers that happen in equilibrium, depending on A's prior belief about which is true. So if it thinks that we're relatively likely living in this world where A has lots of power, probability Q, that's likely, very likely, then A's demand is going to be P prime plus CB. That's just enough to convince B to accept when we are in this world. And of course, B is privately informed, so B knows that it's living in this world. So if it knows that A has lots of power and B doesn't have that much power, it accepts that demand. But of course, with probability 1 minus Q, B is privately informed that A is not as powerful, and so it would reject under those circumstances, and we would get war with positive probability. In contrast, if A is relatively likely living in the second case, where A does not have as much power, its equilibrium demand is P plus CB, which is just enough to get B to accept under that circumstance where B is relatively strong and A is relatively weak. And of course, if B is privately informed that it is weak, then of course it would also accept. So in the second case, we have peace happening with certainty. It's only in the first case where A is making the risky demand that we get war to occur. So what peace premiums are going to do for us is measure how much A is willing to incur risk. So let's think about what's going on here in terms of B's reservation value. What is B's war payoff? Well, in the first case, B's war payoff is 1 minus P prime minus CB. That's this quantity right here. That's how much B needs to receive in order to be happy with the settlement and not prefer to fight. In the second case, B needs this quantity right here, which is 1 minus P minus CB. So you'll notice that this type needs more to accept than this type does. So if A wants to guarantee the piece, A must overpay B in this circumstance because B is not as strong than it is in this circumstance. So if we go back to our definition, how much a proposer must overpay one type to induce another type to accept. Well, remember, this type is making more than this type is. So in order to get this type to accept, the first type to accept, we must overpay this type by the difference in the two values for war. So we can measure that peace premium, the difference in the two types values for war, by simply subtracting one value from the other. And if we do that, if we go ahead and distribute the negative sign, minus 1 plus P prime plus CB, you'll notice that the 1s cancel, the CBs cancel, and we're left as our peace premium of P prime minus P. 
So what that is measuring, if we go back up here, and do a little bit of erasing to keep things clean, the piece premium is equal to the difference in how much A would be offering one type versus another type if it knew what the actual situation was. And that is measuring this quantity here. So this quantity here is P prime minus P. That is the piece premium in this case. So let's visualize why having a large piece premium is conducive to A making the risky demand where only the situation up here is the case where B would accept. If B is privately informed that A has a lot of power, then B accepts. And in contrast, if B is privately informed that A is relatively weak, it rejects. So let's look at two extreme cases. Let's first start the situation where the piece premium is tiny. So here, let's go P prime, P prime plus CB. And in the second case with P, we have P here and P plus CB. So I've made this a tiny piece premium, that much right here. So if A makes the risky demand, which is this quantity here, it has to gamble that giving B this tiny extra amount to guarantee the piece is not worthwhile. If that's the case, A has to be almost positively sure that B in fact is relatively weak and A is relatively strong and the distribution of power is P prime. Otherwise, making this risky gamble here to acquire this tiny extra amount is probably not worthwhile. Q has to be very, very large for A to be willing to make that risk. In contrast, let's imagine that the piece premium is relatively large. So P prime here, P prime plus CB. Whereas P is way down here, and P plus CB is right here. Okay, now if A makes the safe demand, which is this quantity here, it is overpaying B in this case by a considerable amount. It is overpaying it by this quantity here. This is the piece premium of P prime minus P. This is a very large piece premium. It is making a huge unnecessary concession to B when B is relatively weak and A is relatively strong in this circumstance. So as a consequence of that, A finds it advantageous under more circumstances to gamble here than it did in the previous case where that piece premium was very, very small. So piece premiums have a very intuitive property. When they're large, you are less inclined to make peaceful demands. And when they're small, you're more inclined to make peaceful demands. We're starting with a lecture on the intuitiveness of piece premiums because eventually what we're going to see is that what makes a piece premium small or large actually can lead to some very counterintuitive conclusions. So we're starting with an intuitive bit so that you understand what's going on here before we devolve the situation into something a little bit stranger and a little bit more counterintuitive. Hope you enjoyed this and hope to see you next time when we get to one of those counterintuitive results. Take care.